Hi, I'm Matt, and we need to talk about conspiracy theories. Some of you may know that I had a series on this channel where I explored and explained some of the world's most popular conspiracy theories, but that was before the whole world decided to catch fully on fire. Since then, I've seen some of the absolutely wildest claims spread around on the hellscape we refer to as the internet. And not just by people you would traditionally call conspiracy theorists either. No, now your average Joe and Joannes have taken it upon themselves to start spreading damaging and easily debunkable misinformation. So this video is not going to be about how the CIA may be controlling the weather or how an FBI agent might be watching you through your cell phone camera. Instead, I want to take a minute and a big deep breath and talk about why we believe conspiracy theories to begin with. All right, so you've heard about flat earthers and people who deny climate change. And for a more specific example, you finish your day, you get on the social media, and maybe an aunt or a friend or a president might have taken up a particular cause while you were away. Anyway, you know immediately that it's bullshit, but the scary thing is that they believe it. And you're reading comments from other people who believe it too. Your immediate response might be something like, what is wrong with them? And while there may or may not be anything wrong with them, there may be a scientific explanation as to why they suddenly became a conspiracy theorist. In 2017, research published by the Association for Psychological Science theorized that whatever drives people to believe in conspiracy theories can generally be attributed to several different motives. Epistemic motives are described as a subject's desire to create understanding, accuracy, and subjective certainty. This is essentially to say that in this case, someone might be looking into a conspiracy in the first place because of their need to have understanding. To explain that further, let's use the example of my previous assertion that in 1969, we did not land on the moon. So why did I even look into that theory in the first place? Well, in my case, I did it because I demanded an understanding of the event, and it was real didn't provide me with any certainty. Well, for me, there were a number of factors that offered me the understanding that we didn't land on the moon and the certainty that the footage was fake. And perhaps because I so desperately needed that understanding, I was able to hold on to that in the face of a lot of disconfirmation. Additionally, anything that debunked my belief that the moon landing was fake was easily explained with, well, if they faked the moon landing, they can fake that evidence too. An epistemic motive would suggest that it was so important for me to understand and have certainty that any evidence that challenged my certainty was going to be disregarded. Now you see this a lot with climate change. There's a lot of science to show that climate change is real and the information is readily available. But because it challenges what people know to be true or are certain about, the data is ignored or worse, called a hoax. Existential motives are those in which a subject wishes to fulfill a sense of safety or control of their environment. I feel like this is a big one. I've seen this a lot more recently, and it's partially the reason I wanted to make this video in the first place. If it needs more clarification, according to the same study, when a situation has left someone feeling powerless, they might find it empowering to reject official narratives and feel that they possess an alternative solution. For an example here, let's take the current coronavirus pandemic. It has brought on a ton of dread, and I feel like without being hyperbolic, it has asked every person on the planet to reconsider how they're going to live the rest of their lives. We've seen how our government has handled it, and whether or not you believe it was handled well, the sheer amount of death is more than enough to make anybody concerned for their safety. And in trying to understand just exactly what reality is anymore, an alarming amount of people have found solace in conspiracy theories. We've heard examples like the following, and I am not making these up. COVID-19 was created in a Chinese biological warfare lab. It was created by Bill Gates. It is a globalist conspiracy to establish sweeping population control spread by 5G towers. And possibly the most prevalent, that the virus was created by the deep state to undermine Donald Trump, a theory popular of the QAnon collective delusion. While the possibility of someone believing any of those might be truly terrifying to us, to the people who believe them, they might be preferred to the reality that maybe our government doesn't have our best interest in mind, or that the infrastructure of our country is so fragile to begin with that it crumbles when so easily pressed. While coronavirus could challenge their safety and security, one of these conspiracy theories might offer some relief. For social motives, we see those in instances in which a subject believes that being a part of a community of similarly minded individuals promotes a positive self-image and social group association. In addition, it helps foster a system of blame outside of oneself or one's group, which then allows the individual to valorize the self and the in-group by allowing blame for negative outcomes to be attributed to others. An example of this might be racial supremacy groups. In part, the psychology of creating an us versus them allows a conspiracy theorist to feel less alone or powerless. 
Unfortunately, blaming minorities is not uncommon in these instances. Oftentimes, they become the scapegoat. While a person might only need to be driven by one of these motives in order to believe any particular conspiracy theory, oftentimes you'll see it's a combination of the three. These combinations make for a really dangerous psychosocial landscape, especially when it's coupled with a lack of scientific or factual interest. Their faith in conspiracy theories becomes so cherished that there's no way to introduce evidence that could overturn their beliefs. Like I mentioned with the example of the moon landing, anything to the contrary, like scientific evidence, becomes itself a part of the conspiracy theory. So while that might explain why people are drawn to conspiracy theories in general, why so many right now? Well, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that conspiracy theories especially flourish in times of despair, when people have to rationalize awful and bewildering events. And history is rich with instances of this. For example, in the midst of a bubonic plague in 14th century Europe, Jewish people were accused of poisoning the water supply, and many were murdered without any evidence to support the theory. Actually, and alarmingly, a great many conspiracy theories are based in anti-Semitism. Swap out bubonic plague for coronavirus, and Jewish for Chinese, and we take a time travel trip right back to 2020. Unfortunately, too many people don't understand the damage that they cause by spreading the misinformation found in conspiracy theories. Or sometimes maybe they do, and that's why they do it. These conspiracy theories undermine public health officials so much that their effects could not only drag out the pandemic and cause even more preventable deaths, but also cause further damage down the line once this is all over. Oftentimes you'll find conspiracy theories drawing much needed attention away from the actual source of a problem and hindering real solutions. And while some conspiracy theories are relatively harmless, right now public health and safety hangs in the balance of how information and misinformation shapes the response to the pandemic as well as policy making regarding climate change and racial injustice. Additionally, and I can speak to this from personal experience, accepting a conspiracy theory once makes a person more susceptible to believing other conspiracy theories. Experts believe that the consequences of misinformation are now more dangerous for the future, which is why what we do today is so critical. We, well, those of us under the age of 102, have never seen a pandemic like the one we're living through right now, and we have never had information and misinformation so quickly and easily disseminated. Unfortunately, it costs nothing for someone to subscribe to a conspiracy theory, do no research, and spread it like wildfire. Which is why, now more than ever, we have to do our own research and think about the consequences of spreading misinformation. And we really need to be extra careful about where we get our information. Make sure to diversify where you get information and even check the sources of those sources. And if you want to be extremely diligent, it's always a good idea to know who is funding any particular media publication. While the terrifying things I've seen shared on the internet over the last couple months have given me pause, they've also challenged me to not only reconsider the type of information I share on my public profiles, but also the type of content I make and put out in the world. If I can leave you with at least some positivity, over the last few months I have seen some incredible things done with the internet, and we have made some powerful, powerful changes. So let's just remember that power when we share anything, and do our best to only share thoughtful and well-researched information.